Hi, we're now going to extend our study of subroutines to talk about an important concept called the core stack. And this is important for understanding concepts like recursion later on. Now, every program has got a special area of memory which is allocated just for subroutines. And it's not so much for the subroutine code or where the subroutine is located or the name of your subroutine. It's more for properties of the subroutine. And this is called the core stack. So the core stack is just part of the wider memory used for a running program. And what the call stack does is keep track of all the subroutines that have started, but actually haven't finished yet. So just as a really quick reminder, a subroutine is a named block of code, which we can execute by calling it. And so we can write its name in our main program and it will call the subroutine and run its code. Now there are three important bits of information which we've got to keep track of if we want to be able to use multiple subroutines at any given point. Now these are parameters, so the input to the subroutine. You might have no parameters, you might have several. You've also got local variables. Again, you might have none, you might have loads. And also the return address. Now, this is not the actual value being returned. This is not where the return happens. This is where is it going to return to, as in where the subroutine was called from. So we call our subroutine, it jumps up to the definition, the subroutine code. When it returns, it's gonna jump back to where you called it, and that is the return address. And of the three, arguably that's the most important to keep track of in your call stack. Now, these three important bits of information are held in something called a stack frame for every subroutine you've got active. Now, we've got our call stack, which I picture as sort of just like a, almost like a jug um, which we can stick stuff in, and we are sticking multiple stack frames. So each subroutine has its own unit in this memory called the stack frame. So what happens is, initially the call stack is empty, but as soon as you call a subroutine, a frame is added for that subroutine to the call stack, and it will contain information in this turquoise-ish box. Now, as you might know if you've studied stacks in another area of computer science, a stack is a particular kind of data structure, which is a last in, first out structure. All that means is data is only added to it from the top. So it only ever grows in this visualization, it only ever grows upwards. We are pushing stuff onto the stack and it grows up like that. So right now I've got three subroutine stack frames, meaning I've got three subroutines which have been opened and are started to run, but haven't finished yet. Now the idea of having several subroutines active at any given point, but not directly being executed at that one point is confusing. But if we have a subroutine, which is calling another subroutine, which is calling another subroutine, well there you have multiple subroutines which have started to run, but haven't actually finished yet. And so that will be represented with multiple frames on the stack. And until the subroutines finish, which in effect means return, once they return a value, they're going to remain on the stack. As soon as that subroutine hits return, the stack frame is going to leave the call stack. Now, you might be thinking, well, not every subroutine returns a value. You're thinking about procedures, but they're going to finish at some point. And so once they do finish, the frame is going to get removed. But we say return because most subroutines do return a value. Even a procedure, often behind the scenes, will return zero or return none, we just don't see that. Now I remove that third frame for a reason. A stack has also got the property that the last item in is always the first item out. So we would never, in this situation, we would never remove frame two before frame three. It's always the top item on the stack which gets removed first. And this is for a reason we'll come on to in a few minutes time. So third frame goes, Let's say we've got another subroutine being called, that gets added. We've got another subroutine being called, that gets added, etc., etc. Now, of course, memory is finite, and so eventually you run out of space. Once you run out of space in your stack, we get an error, and this error is called a stack overflow. This will often happen if you slightly mess up your recursion calls, as we'll look at in another video. But the stack overflow is not just a, a website, it's, a, it's an actual concept in computer science when you run out of space on your call stack. Right, let's look at an example because I think, to be honest, this could 
completely go over your head if you haven't seen an example. Here I've got two subroutines I've defined, two functions in fact, which is a, some Python code here, but hopefully you can understand it no matter what language you know. I've got these two function definitions, sub one and sub two. All they do is just made up, but they both add numbers together. I've got two lines at the bottom in my main program where I've called both of these subroutines. So I've got my empty call stack right now, and let's trace through the code and see what happens to the call stack. Well, first of all, the program runs and lines one to eight, nothing really happens. At least nothing happens regarding the call stack. The definitions will get stored somewhere else in memory, but not in my call stack because they're not called yet. But in line nine, we are assigning the variable result one to the result of the sub one call. So I'm calling sub one in line nine. And as soon as I do, we create a stack frame for that subroutine. I'm using the letters P, L, and R to represent the parameters, the local variables, and the return address in this case. So we jump up to line one effectively, right? Now A is our parameter for sub one, and A is going to be set to four. So that'll be the first thing which gets filled in in my stack frame. We can also fill in the return address because we know the return address is going to be line nine. Now remember, this is where you've come from when you've called it and where you're going to at the end, right? We came from line nine. And so when I'm done, I'm gonna go back to line nine is the idea. And it's gotta keep track of that, otherwise it will you know, literally forget and not know where to return to. Now we run the code, B is set to two, B is a local variable, I can stick that in. Then we're gonna return A and B. So we're gonna return two plus four, it's gonna be six. But that's not really that relevant for my stack frame, that'll get held somewhere else in memory. As soon as you finish, you go back to line nine and the stack frame is popped off the stack, it gets removed and forgotten about. Now to be clear, this isn't the only area of memory, we've also got another area of memory which will hold things that are variable results. So result one isn't forgotten about, result one will be set to six in another area of memory, just not in the call stack. Okay, we get to line 10. Result two is now set to another subroutine call, but this time to sub two, and so this gets created. Now, if we look at sub two, we've got a slight difference in that we've got another local variable called D, but this is a result of another subroutine call. But we'll come back to that in a second. C is our parameter, which is set to seven. You can see the argument seven down at the bottom, and we're gonna to return to line 10 this time when we are done. But we get to line six. D is set to the call of sub one with the parameter C. Well, we've got to therefore create another stack frame for sub one. And because it's a stack, this gets added at the top. Now, if I fill this in straight away, we've got the parameter A being set to seven because C is seven. We've got B set to two as always in sub one and it's returning this time to line six because this particular call of sub one was on line six. We've currently got two distinct calls of sub one in this code in line six and line nine, which is why it's especially important to keep track of which one you're referring to. If it just left off the return address, how would it know whether it's meant to return to line six or line nine? It wouldn't, which is why we've got to keep it in the stack frame. All right, so sub one finishes, we return A and B, which in this case is seven plus two, which is nine. That goes, that'll be held in the local variable D. And so we can now fill that in, in our sub two stack frame. And now sub two can return because C plus D, seven plus nine is 16. And sub two, it's done. And so that stack frame is removed from the call stack. Now again, result one was set to, oh my goodness, I've forgotten on what six. And result two was now set to 16. They're held somewhere else. But for now, we've got no active subroutines, and so our call stack is left empty. So that is our call stack, a really, really essential feature in order to keep track of different subroutines, their values, and crucially, where they return to.